So when we organized the program, uh, I made it um, a goal to finish in an upbeat manner every single day. And we are very fortunate to have with us today one of the great leaders of our organization. For most of our membership, he needs no introduction. Lewis Collins is the consummate leader. He's a partner in the Butler Law Firm in Tampa, Florida, where he heads the Liability Defense Practice Group. He is, of course, a past president of the Federation, chair of the Federation Foundator, Foundation, and leader in the Lawyers for Civil Justice. Please welcome Lewis Collins. In the late 1700s, England was a beacon of freedom. Its parliamentary form of democracy was the envy of those who were ruled by kings or tyrants. Its leaders were influenced greatly by the economy, which was a strengthened economy throughout the world. Hail Britannia ruled the seas, and those seas were ruled by the shippers. One of the foremost, most profitable shipping interests of that time was the shipment of human beings, slavery. 11 million men, women, and children were taken from Africa. They were herded like cattle, stacked like timber wood. They were shackled, their ankles, their wrists, and their neck, and they were confined to ships in an area four feet long and 16 inches wide. Upon arriving in the Caribbean, their property, they were sold to slave owners and taken to sugar plantations. And upon their arrival, they were branded on the right shoulder. And the branding was to remind them that they were no longer children of God, but possessions of human beings. Into this world was born a very unlikely leader. As a child, he was very frail. He had very poor eyesight and was sickly. But he had a sharp mind and he was very articulate. While a student at Cambridge, he was a party student. But leaving Cambridge and attaining the age of 21, he was elected to the House of Commons and immediately established himself as a leader with his inspirational and wit. However, one night changed his whole life. He was invited to dinner by the man who was to become the head of parliament. And there he met a former slave ship captain, some ministers of the day, and a former slave. As the shackles were placed on the dinner table and the slave revealed his slave tattoo and branding, they told the story of slavery and put a burden on his heart. That night he pledged to introduce a bill into Congress, into the parliament, to end slavery. 10 years later, he counted noses and he had the votes. But the night before the vote, the powerful business interests gave tickets to the opera to his supporters and they didn't show up for the vote. The war with France then ensued, and another 10 years, a total of 20 years, he battled. And eventually, the abolition of slave trading throughout the United Kingdom was abolished. He was taught by Aristotle, and he was guided by that moral character that was the central DNA of his life, and in my research, is the central DNA of all 
inspirational leaders. Inspiration literally means to breathe life into. That former slave ship owner wrote one of the most memorable songs of all time, Amazing Grace. And he told Wilberforce, if you make a difference in the world in one thing, the world becomes better in all things. The all things happened because he inspired leaders that followed him. Eighty years after the abolition of slavery in the British Empire, another leader came along. He was a leader who came to the young democracy in America who was directly inspired by Wilverforce. And he had that essential ingredient because he was also a student of Aristotle. If you look at this man's writings and his speeches, every single one had a foundation in that moral character that he needed. And the nation needed him badly. As in the days of Wilberforce, this man came into a society that had a seismic fissure occurring. And into that void, he stepped and he gave to America its moral high ground. As the threads of the nation were beginning to unravel, he was there to use his strength of character and his will to keep those threads intact through a very, very difficult time in our country. And like Wilberforce, he believed that slavery was immoral and unjust. Because of the inspiration that he received from moral thinkers like Aristotle and people like Wilberforce, he had the courage during the war to issue the Emancipation Proclamation and give his vision to the world. He paid for that vision, the ultimate price. Now, I want to take you 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation to the capital of Arkansas. Nine teenagers were inspired by Lincoln. Nine teenagers who sought their courage and sought their strength of character to enter the fray. They're known as the Little Rock Nine, but I'm just going to talk about one of them. When these nine teenagers signed up to become students at Central High School, Central High School was all white. Now, mind you, this was 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, but more importantly, three years after Brown versus Board of Education, all white. Upon hearing of their registration, the governor of Arkansas dispatched the National Guard to block the way. Tensions in Little Rock were boiling over. The focus of the country through the news media focused on Little Rock, and President Eisenhower had to send in the army to open the way for these kids. Elizabeth Eckford, pictured in this, sh is this shot, was walking in that first day. And they asked her, how was it? She said, as I walked through the crowd, they screamed at me, they threw things at me, and they said the most awful things. My heart was beating out of my chest. She said, I looked around and I tried to find a face to calm me. She found the face of this elderly lady and she said it was a sweet face. She said, that started to calm me down. But then right behind me, this girl came out of the crowd and kept screaming at me. I turned her, looked at her, and then I turned back to the lady for that comfort, and she spit on me. These kids had to endure this kind of treatment as teenagers. But what they did 
in Little Rock galvanized the nation and started to turn the tide of segregation. What I'm trying to do today is talk to you about what I believe are the five principles of inspirational leadership. I've studied this a lot over the years, and these are kind of the distillation of what history teaches me about these leaders. And in the few minutes that I have remaining, I'm going to talk really briefly about each of these principles. The first person that I'm going to talk about was also a president of the United States, and this is what he said about his job as president. But when you see who this is, you'll think, how can this be? This is the guy that's charged up San Juan Hill, who is said to kill a bear with his bare hands. This was Teddy Roosevelt. But there's a story that intrigues me about Teddy Roosevelt. And of all people, this story comes from his steward, the person who took care of and looked after the president. After about six months in the White House, the steward saw a strange thing happening after dinner every night with his family. The president would walk out into the Rose Garden for about 15 or 20 minutes and just sit there and look at the sky, not saying a word, not doing anything other than being quiet and looking up. After seeing this over and over again, the steward finally screwed up his courage and said, Mr. President, what are you doing out there? He said, Jimmy, he said, I am the president of the most powerful nation on earth. I command the most powerful army in the world. I have to remind myself every night how insignificant and small I am. That is the true mark of a person who is a humble servant leader. Tina Turner said, what's love got to do with it? Well, loving the people you lead is a key ingredient for an inspirational leader. This man, the US Army Chief of Staff, is the quote I want to read to you about loving. Can you believe coming from an army general, the chief of staff? Here's the quote that I took from his commencement address to the cadets at West Point. I suspect that soldiers perform more efficiently when they are confident that they are loved and valued by those tasked with the awful burden of sending them on to possible death. That's what an inspirational do leader does. He loves or she loves the people they lead. Now let me quote another great songwriter, John Lennon, who said, the love you take is equal to the love you make. That's really hard when you apply it to this person. How can that be? This person was subjected to water cannons, police dogs, beaten, jailed, ridiculed, and killed. What did he have to say about the love he is supposed to make based upon the love he took? Here's what he said. Hate is too great a burden. He chooses love. He would never have been as effective as a leader had he not shown that love for society that he did. That's a rather weird thing to say right after talking about love, that you should stand up to bullies. But a key ingredient of an inspirational leader is doing just that. And my favorite example of that is a real strong man. Not really the type of person you think is going to stand up to a bully. A very tiny man, very meek, very humble. This man, through his will and his moral character 
at the center of his being, stood up to the greatest power in the world, the British Empire. And not a single bullet was fired. Not a single, single tank was marshaled to do so. He did it with words and fasting and love. Standing up to bullies, though, is a very important thing for inspirational leaders. Communicating your beliefs with passion has got to be part of the equation. And for an example of that, I came back to a, a person that we talked about earlier. One of the most passionate speeches that conveyed his dream was delivered in Washington, D.C. at the reflecting pool to a million people. But it went further than that, as you know. He delivered his passionate communication by believing that one day people would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, the moral center of inspiration that's delivered with passion. Greatest example, in my opinion. Two very strange bedfellows, a Chinese philosopher and probably the greatest general of World War II. How in the world can these two gentlemen have anything in passion about surrounding yourself with great people and empowering those people that you surround yourself with? Here's what they had to say about that. It's almost word for word exactly the same thing. True inspirational leaders give to the people that surround them their beliefs and their focus and their vision and then trust them, those people, enough to empower them to go forth and lead in their own way. They don't micromanage. They don't control everything. They empower others. And I'm going to end with this young president. He inspired people of my generation in the 60s when I was in high school and college. He told America in his inauguration speech, we're going to go to the moon. Talk about shooting high. So he's very much committed to sending a man to the moon in the 60s. And he impassioned, you know, in a passionate way, told America, we're going to do it. And America believed him. But the best way that I can give you an example of empowering others is and, and giving people a vision that they are part of a greater thing than them is emblematic of when he went to NASA. He went to NASA to talk to the astronauts and the scientists and the engineers to give them a pep talk and say, come on, we can do it. As he's walking through NASA, there's a man sweeping the floors. And the president, to be polite, stopped, asked him his name, said, what are you doing here at NASA? He said, Mr. President, I'm sending a man to the moon. That is what leaders do. They empower everyone by inspiring them, by breathing life into them so that they believe they're part of a greater cause. So this is what inspired leadership yields. It yields things that many people think are impossible. But it doesn't have to be great things like this. It doesn't have to be world-changing events. You can inspire people in your family, in your firm, in your synagogue or church. You can inspire people at the checkout counter that you happen to meet when you're buying your groceries or a man sweeping a floor at NASA. I hope today I've inspired you 
I hope I have breathed some life into you. And I hope you leave here today with that strength of moral character as in your DNA to know that it will drive you to greater things. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.